that you'll open up our eyes that we're able to see. I pray that you'll open up our ears that we're able to hear. But most of all, Jesus, I ask and I plead and I beg, Father, open up our hearts that we might receive you today like never before. Amen. Amen. We're going to call this servant favor. And the reason why we're calling this servant favor is because I'm going to give you all of the goodies at the beginning of the sermon. I, I usually try to wait until the end, but you know what? I'm going to be unorthodox today. Uh, the, the, the Eutychus' name means favor. Come on, talk to me. Uh, Eutychus' name means favor. Now, let me give you a, a little story about myself. I, when I went to Andrews, my roommate and I were about the only two guys that left Oakwood unmarried. Come on, somebody say, have mercy. And we were the only two guys unmarried. And so, you know, uh, no one else would hang out with us at Andrews. Because, you know, the married guys always hung out with each other and their wives. They, 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 they almost clicked together. If, if, you weren't, if you wasn't married, you never got the invites to the Sabbath dinners and so on and so forth. Come on, a pastor partner, tell the truth. And shame the devil. And, and so what would happen is my, my roommate and I said, you know, let's, let's make an investment into a Xbox at that time, the Xbox 360. And so we had an Xbox 360 and we loved that thing. That thing became like our wife. Come on, somebody talk to me. We would play with an Xbox morning, noon, and night. Come on, talk to me. And uh, uh, subsequently to graduation, I still wasn't married. When I got hired and moved down to Orlando, Mount Sinai, I still wasn't married. And, and uh, it so happened that I picked the long straw and got to keep the Xbox 360. And the Xbox was with me at my point, at my, at my apartment down in Apopka. And one day, and I, and I have them to put up this slide, one day I came up to my house. And, you know, as a single man, you know, my schedule for the day was that I would wake up early in the morning, yeah. have my devotion. Right. And you know, my senior pastor at that time was Herman Davis, so he was at church at 8 o'clock in the morning. That meant that, come on now, I had to be at church at 8 o'clock in the morning. And sometimes I would be at church all day long. And so on my way home, you know, uh, being a single man, I would stop by Taco Bell and get me some bean burritos, come on, talk to me. And we'd go home and I would sit down and the only thing I had in my apartment, my, my, my wife would tell you, that I had nothing in my apartment except for a TV, come on, talk to me, a TV stand, come on now, no table, a couch, and an Xbox 360, come on now. And so I, I happened to come home one night and I, it was a long Sunday, we had board meeting, and you know how the saints can do the preachers during board meeting, and I wanted to just unwind, come on, talk to me. And, and I began to sit back and I turned on my Xbox 360. And usually when everything goes well with your Xbox 360, you'll have a, a series of green lights that let you know that everything is on and popping. You're ready to play the video game. But on this particular Sunday, I came home and sat down on my couch in my empty apartment. I had my bean burritos on my lap and I turned on the Xbox 360. And instead of seeing the, the green lights, come on, talk to me, I, I, I ended up seeing four red lights. And, and you know, and I did not know what it meant until I went on the internet. They called that thing the ring of death. Come on, talk to me. And I learned a, a valuable lesson on that day that there is a cycle to life. Come on, talk to me. That in life you are born to eventually die. And the only thing that can keep you from dying is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Come on. And, and I found out the hard way that, that it is a matter of how much money you put into an Xbox that eventually, come on, talk to me, that it's going to die. Come on, talk to me. Uh, uh, listen, I don't care how much money you put into your house, eventually one day, maybe not this year, but maybe 50 years from now, your house is going to be boarded up. Come on, talk to me. I don't care how much you put in your car. Listen, I, I put a lot of money in my car, but eventually my car will have its last um, To life. Clothes fades. And people 
eventually die. Yes. Here we are, Acts chapter 20. And there is a young man, his name is Eutychus. His name is, mean favor. And the Bible says that it is the first day of the week when the disciples came together to do what? To break, come on talk to me, to break bread. Paul was ready to depart. The next day spoke to them and continued his message until about what time? Midnight. Midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together and the window sat a certain man named Eutychus who was sinking, come on talk to me, in deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, the Bible says, and Paul, and as Paul continued to, uh, to speak, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Now, I want to give a little bit of context because you have to understand that the Bible here acts says he was taken up dead. Now, the, the author of Luke Acts is none other than Dr. Luke. Come on, talk to me. And as a physician, he is qualified uh, to sign off on a death certificate. And so when he says that this young man was dead, he was not comatose. Come on, talk to me. He was not knocked out. He didn't have the wind knocked out of him. Dr. Luke says he was dead. And so we gotta get this, that Eutychus was indeed dead. And I kind of find out that uh, there are many Eutychuses in the church. Who come to the place where the gospel is to be preached. They, they come to the place where the, the good news should be lavished freely. And, and, and I come to find out that there are many unicuses in the church who are in the church physically. Come on, talk to me. But spiritually, they're not in the church. Come on, talk to me. I don't know if you ever noticed that. You know, and I tell, I tell parents, uh, you know, um, don't force your kids to come to church. Watch this. Because your kid, I, I, I have an older brother who would protest church right in the middle of church. Y'all ain't with me. He would come to church and he would be protesting church while church was going on. This is what happens to this Eutychus. The church is happening. Paul is preaching. Whatever is saying is mesmerizing because the Bible says that no one is even paying attention to Eutychus. Everyone is paying attention to the Word of God. But Eutychus somehow slips through the cracks. The first point I want to make is that I want you to be very careful and pay attention to the fact that Eutychus was located at the window. He was located at the window. His location has significance for us this evening because I want you to know that the windows signifies the avenues of our souls. Come on, talk to me. And I want you to know that, that even Sister White talks about guarding the avenues of our souls. I'm trying to get the quote for you. Uh, Sister White talks about guarding the avenues of our souls and because, because sometimes when we are not guarding the avenues of our souls, we can be in the church, but yet be out of the church. She says this, yet we have a work to do, watch this, to resist temptation. Those who would not fall a prey to Satan's devices must guard, watch this, where the avenues of the what? Of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. The mind should not be left to wonder at random upon every subject that the adversary of the soul may suggest. And there's the first thing I want you to know that, that if you want to be saved, if you don't want to be spiritually dead, you must guard the avenues of your soul. Y'all women nice. The second thing I want you to know about uh, safekeeping or safeguarding you from being spiritually dead is that you need to understand that sleeping can be hazardous to your spiritual health. Come on, talk to me. Uh, sleeping can be hazardous to your spiritual health. Now, I want to I want to be fair. I want to be balanced. You know, there are benefits to sleep. Come on, talk to me. I, I did a little bit of research and I looked at the Harvard Prison Review 
and they tell me that sleeping will improve your memory. Come on, talk to me. Say that sleeping will cause you to live longer. Say that sleeping will curb. Come on, talk to me. Your information. Some of us ain't getting enough sleep. Come on now. It says sleeping will spur creativity. If you try to, to, to write a paper or if you try to be creative and you can't find yourself to be creative, it's because you're not getting enough sleep. Uh, and some of us, it says also that sleeping can make you even more athletic. Come on, somebody. I said, that's my excuse. I'm, I'm not as athletic as I used to be because I don't get, come on now, enough sleep. Uh, sleeping even lowers your stress level. But then, I've come to find out that there are times, come on, talk to me, when sleeping can be hazardous. Sleeping can be hazardous when handling heavy equipment. Come on, talk to me. You might not want to be sleeping when you're handling heavy equipment. You may not want to be sleeping when you're driving a car. Come on, talk to me. Uh, you may not want to be asleep if the house catches on fire. Come on, talk to me. And, and, and furthermore, you may not want to fall asleep along your spiritual journey. Yeah. And so this is what the enemy wants to do to us. He wants to cause us to be asleep spiritually. Yeah. And so the so this second attacks uh, are meant to desensitize us to the prompting of God. In other words, he tries to get us to not be able to be sensitive yeah. to the prompting of God. And some of the ways he does that is through temptation. Now, I want to I wanna stop here because I want you to know that there are tests and there are temptations. Come on, talk to me. Someone said you cannot have a test unless you, or you cannot have a testimony unless you have what? A test. Now watch this. Tests are not meant for you to fail, but tests are there in order to find out if you have learned what you should have learned. Come on, talk to me. I, I remember when I was at Andrews, I loved it. Our teachers, right before the exam, would tell us what's going to be on the exam. Come on now. But watch this. There are times when the enemy now, he will not test you, but he will what? Test you. And the purpose of temptation, watch this, is to get you to fall. And so what happens is the enemy sends temptations our way to lull us away from our acuteness, our spiritual acuteness. In other words, he sends temptation our way to get us to be desensitized to the promptings of God. So God cannot tempt you. He might test you, but he will never uh, tempt you. Now Satan will tempt you. Morally, the more we fall, the further we go. Every time we have the ability to acquiesce the enemy, the further down we go. As a matter of fact, the more we acquiesce the enemy, the less we are able to hear the prompting of the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's why some of us go from one temptation to another temptation to another temptation because what happens in essence is that the enemy has successfully lost us in a state of spiritual sleep. Spiritual slumber. But I'm glad that First Corinthians lets us know that they have no temptation taking you. That such as is coming to that. Come on, talk to me. But God is faithful. Come on now. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but with the temptation he will also make a way of escape that you are able to bear. Come on, talk to me. I'm so glad that I serve a God. That when I am tempted, he'll say, I got a way of escape for you. I'm so glad that I serve a God who, I, he says, I understand temptation because I
to the point where the church no longer had any impact on him. In fact, I want you to know that the Bible says that the upper room was lit up with lamps. They were lit up with torches. It wasn't like it is today when you can turn on the lights and you have uh, the ability to see. But back then, you had to turn on, you had to light up the torches. So watch this. The more lit it was in that room, the, the, the harder it was for this young man to stay awake because the warmer it got. Make some kind of application here. I will simply tell you all that the light that we have, come on, talk to me. This knowledge, this, 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 this light, this truth that we have will not keep us alive. Come on, talk to me. Oh, y'all ain't looking tonight. This, this gospel that we claim to be the truth that we have, this, this light, this light will not keep us alive. The only thing that can keep us, we've talked about this whole week, is our relationship with Jesus Christ.
going to have a restored order in this church. That we have to learn to not ask questions, but to first embrace. Yesterday we said we can't clean the fish before you catch the fish. You got to catch the fish and then let the Holy Ghost clean the fish. It's not up to us to clean the fish. God's job is to clean the fish. All we ask us to do is to go out and to catch the fish. And I think that what's happening in our churches, the reason why some of our churches have more pews than people is because you got people in church who are more concerned with cleaning the fish than you are with catching the fish. And so now, so now the Bible says that Paul Another 